Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology. Tonight we have a guest, Josh Scott. Welcome to the show, Josh. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about tonight uh, workers' health issues in the cannabis sector. And so tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and the organization that you're with. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I don't know if I should say this. It's like an honor to be on the show. Um, so I'm with the Center for Health, Work, and Environment. Uh, it's at the Colorado School of Public Health, which is over on the Anschutz Medical Campus, uh, the group that I'm involved with. And um, we've partnered with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment uh, to produce really the first ever safety occupational safety training for marijuana cultivation workers. So, you know, it's a workforce that has some inherent hazards in the work that they do. And we produced a really basic training on how to mitigate those hazards. So the training you're talking about, is this something that was like brand new or is it building off of something that already exists? Like, is there already a robust training that exists and you're repurposing or is this like from scratch? Well, there was um, a, uh, a robust essentially guidance document that was produced. Uh, it was a collaborative document that, that really highlighted what the hazards are and what you should do. But it was a long document. It was about 80 pages long. And we said, well, we don't actually think that people who need that information are going to read that information. So we said, what can we do to get that information into the hands of people uh, who actually do the work? And so we produced this training completely from scratch. So um, I've been lucky to work with you on the committee through the Colorado Department of Public Health that um, crafted the document and has organized the training. So I've been lucky to learn from you the way you're organizing it. And um, you know, just to share with you the vision to number one, increase public awareness. And I think number two, also figure out like how to ensure that when you look at a workplace, especially in the legal cannabis sector, that workers are protected, employers are doing the best that they can to ensure the workforce is protected. And so my question to you, so far, have you seen um, a success in the work in terms of the people you've been able to reach? And what, what kinds of like feedback have you gotten? Well, I think there's a couple levels of which we're seeing successes. I mean, when you do any sort of training, you hope that people walk away with a good experience from the training. So you always ask, did you enjoy it? Did you learn something? You know, what was most valuable to you? And the, and the immediate feedback we got was, uh, the industry was craving this and that they needed this. Um, the, the longer term feedback that we're getting, because we're doing kind of pre-course surveys, post-course surveys, and even six month follow-ups to see, you know, are people kind of following through with the change that they said they were gonna do? Um, and we're starting to see some really promising results. People are saying, one, they learned a lot and they're retaining that learning, which is what you hope. And that um, people who indicated they were going to try to change some behavior at work, like, you know, maybe some behavior around uh, ergonomics of how they lift and transport plants, uh, they've actually made those changes, which is a big deal. I mean, <laughs> yeah, especially when you talk about changing practices, it's like sometimes very challenging. Behavior is like the hardest thing in the world to change, right? People have to want to change. Right. So for those people that haven't had a chance to attend one of these trainings, so take us to like the most recent one. Um, is it people just sitting in the audience and hearing eight hours of lectures? Like, like what happens and who are the people that are there? Uh, well, I'd like to, uh, I'm very pleased to say that we're adaptable. So in the first training we produced, which I'll, uh, I'll say was a pilot training, I think that was kind of the approach we took a little bit. Is it, uh, uh, it was a little bit more uh, talking and didactic and less movement, less interactive. And in the most recent training, which you're, which you're representing, which was on a, a March or a November 15th of this past year, you know, um, it was a little bit of learning, which we highlighted case studies of, that people submitted so people submitted case studies of this is what we're experiencing. And we used those case studies to say, here's how you would handle that situation. And here's the concept behind why you would handle it this way. Um, and then we had them work in small groups to address really common hazards at the workplace. So if you, if you have to get up on scaffolding to change lights, well, 
what hazards are involved with that and how do you address those hazards? Oh, and we had them work in small groups to do that. So it's good because people, um, as we know, when you sit in a lecture hall for eight hours <laughs> and just get presented to with PowerPoints, it gets exhausting. So there was a lot of interaction. Um, yep. and, and, and tell me about um, the kinds of people that were represented and was it something that you think you're going to be involved in the medium to long term or is this just sort of a one stop th thing, like a one time off thing? Pretty good at this. Those are good questions. <laughs> um, so we actually looked back at, you know, because we have all the registration information, at who actually took it? Because our goal was to reach people working in, you know, cannabis cultivation. And about 80% of the people who attended, so we, or I should say 80% of the people who registered, we had about 240 people across the trainings. And 80% were people who actually worked in cannabis cultivation. So we thought that was great. And most of them were um, about, 75% supervised other people. So they weren't, uh, they, they had some influence at the workplace, which is what we want to see. And the other 25% that made up those that worked in cannabis cultivation were people who were actually performing the duties on a daily basis. So we, we felt like we had influence on both levels, people doing the work and people supervising the work. Um, and then the second part of your question was, you know, so, so what now, right? We have, um, well, I think two things. We have this robust amount of information that we collected that's going to help us both evolve the training over time, um, but also inform new trainings. And so other states are really interested in the work that we're doing. That's why we actually webcasted one of the trainings. We actually had folks from six different states around the country attend that webcast. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and so we don't want to be a traveling circus. Uh, we're going to produce some kind of train the trainer modules so other states can adapt a similar curriculum for training. Um, we're going to produce more online training and we're going to produce more topic specific training. So people really wanted to know about legal compliance and how you actually address some of the ergonomic considerations and the different uh, governing regulatory bodies. So we're going to produce some more topic specific trainings for those folks. That's great. I'm really glad you mentioned the the webcasting because I like the use of technology in that way to reach, you know, beyond the borders of Colorado. So one thing that you did, you know, the group day, which I really enjoyed, you had some like response ways where individuals in the audience could respond to a question. So so tell me about that and what was the benefit or what was the gain with that kind of technology? Yeah. So that's um, uh, we use text polling in which um, people's responses to certain questions via text would show up on the screen real time behind us. So you can use that for a variety of ways. We used it in really two big ways. One is to test immediate understanding. Do you get what I'm saying, right? The second way that we used it was, you know, you are kind of sometimes talking about more sensitive topics, right? You're asking maybe people to disclose on what hazards exist at their workplace and they're not, they're not ready to stand up and raise their hand saying, this is a hazard I face. And so when you're talking about more sensitive topic, having some kind of anonymity within your audience really provoked a pretty good response. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Some of the questions were really hard. It was like <laughs> retaining what was said five minutes ago yeah. or, or just you know answering something very specific to weed. I do remember that, um, you know, because as an academic <laughs> and as a person who loves the technology, I thought maybe in the future, because it did affect my response, the answers were immediately up there. <laughs> and so when I saw the response, I'm like, okay, maybe it's not C, maybe I should do A. <laughs> yes. So next time I would say, let a minute go by and then show it, because otherwise people would get pulled into like whatever's up there. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we call that bias. <laughs> Right, it was definitely some bias in that of, of you could tell like the first uh, uh, 20 to 30 seconds was kind of like the real answer people were to getting. And then you could see what the actual correct one was all of a sudden surged ahead <laughs> because people got it. Oh, I should answer C right now. Yeah, because yeah. no one wants to fail. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. so um, I really want to go through, um, you know, from your experience, what the issues are in the workplace that the training addresses. You mentioned ergonomics, but I want to go through that. But first, I want to talk a little bit about, more about you. So one of the things that's really interesting about what you do is, you know, cannabis is such a complex issue. And so take me to like, you know, your Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> or a conversation with a sibling or yeah. parent or whatever. So what have people said to you about you engaged in cannabis at the level that you're at? Yeah. Um, so 
you know, we address this at multiple levels, and this is like the stigma that people that work in cannabis face, both people who work within facilities and within distrib you know, distribution, and also academics. I mean, we face it all the time. And um, so uh, uh, two conversations. One is the one I had with my family, and I was actually having a conversation with my mom on the way over. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a public access show tonight uh, about the work we're doing in marijuana and weed. And she was like, oh. <laughs> Like, that's nice. Yeah, everyone's going to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the Midwest. It's uh, less accepted. Um, but I also grew up in a family that, you know, was uh, cultivated, in, in pun intended, in the 70s. And, you know, there's a high level of acceptance. So, you know, they're excited about it. I think our workplace is a more interesting one. In our kind of uh, the unit in which I work in, uh, in the Center for Health Work and Environment, our, you know, it's like, where can we have the biggest impact for the people that need it? And everything else is, to be honest, it's, bull, it's, it's BS. Like, we don't really care about the noise. We want to partner with whoever, wh whomever, whatever, if that's going to have the biggest impact on the people who need our help. Right. And that, so, th so that conversation was cut pretty easy. Yeah, it's great hearing you. It makes me think that I would love to see in the future maybe trainings like in a workplace or in a community center near like, you know, Green Mile or, you know, I-70 corridor. Line it up, man. Let's do it. Yeah, no, there's so much that could be done. And yeah. I've been very grateful on the show, you know, like Jolene Donahue yeah, and others yeah. who are really involved to just try to understand, you know, what's a day in the life like? And, you know, have you been happy with the successes? And, and how do you measure? Like, like with your work with these trainings, like, you know, when you are done at the end of the day, you've had two trainings so far. What's one or two measures that you look internally to say that you and your group did a good job? You know, one of them, so you asked a question like, what hazards do, act, do people actually face? And what's really interesting is if, if we look at some data from, from Pinnacle Assurance, the workers' compensation provider, and some other sources, you know, most of the accidents injuries, just on a number basis and on the amount of cost that they have, uh, it slips, trips, falls, cuts, lacerations, those things. But if you actually look at what people are most concerned about, right, it's about maybe respiratory issues, dermal exposures, like mm -hmm. thing, you know, things touching their skin and having some sensitization. Um, and so one of our goals was that it's not that people ignored their perception of what's hazardous, but it maybe shifted a little bit. Because I don't think they were thinking, wow, it's hazardous for me to do this job repetitively over time. And we actually saw that from pre, kind of pre-course to post-course of what are they viewing as hazardous within their workplace? We saw a shift. And that was really big. I mean, so that's a shift in perception of what's dangerous. Yeah, and that's great. And I know these are ongoing discussions. Yeah. Um, so let's just take a break. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, we're going to run a video, and it was a video about cannabis, and it's a digital story produced by a student in a course of mine called Cannabis Culture. Um, the course is in the anthropology department at UC Denver, and I teach it every May. And so the video, it's a digital story, and it focuses on a couple of the cultural issues um, about cannabis. So I hope you enjoy the video. My name is Sandra Lopez and I have lived in Denver, Colorado for nearly 45 years. I have lived in my home on Lincoln Street for 28 years. Over time, many things have changed. Some things for the better and some things for the worse. At one point, I felt this neighborhood was a close community, a group of friends and family. Then came marijuana. No one ever asked me if I wanted this drug in my neighborhood. Even though I protested these businesses by calling and writing the mayor, no one listened and no one responded. It was as if my voice and vote had been taken away. Soon, the marijuana industry grew. Some facilities even opened within a thousand feet of my grandchild's school. The smell and airborne chemicals filled their school. Does no one see the risk? What a health hazard this may be? I protested for the health of my grandbabies, but no one in government would talk to me. It was proven elected officials feel I have no vote or voice in my community. The marijuana companies continue to grow all around me. More and more, it changed the neighborhoods. Every night, I see people in neighborhood walk up and down the street smoking marijuana. I could not even sleep through the night without the smell coming into my home, constantly reminding me of what my grandbabies are forced to breathe. Every day this continues, the government shows that they don't care about me, my family, or my community. We're not a thought in their greed for money and power. 
I want to leave. I wish I could leave, but I can't. I have nowhere to go. Leaving may one day not be up to me. The marijuana businesses have increased property values in my neighborhood, and I have even seen rent increase more and more over the years. My friends are being forced to move far away from the community that they have known for decades. I'm not sure how much higher the rent will go and if I can keep up with the increasing cost. I may not have enough money to stay. Today, I have new neighbors. They look at me differently and treat me like a stranger. I'm not the stranger. They are. I'm friendly to them, but a simple hello is not returned. My voice has been taken. I cannot protect my family. I cannot leave or stay. And now I'm being alienated where I live. The marijuana industry has changed my life and neighborhood. Who are these people? Where am I? It is another community and culture completely now that marijuana has moved in. I feel trapped and isolated in my own home. Welcome back to the show. I'm Marty Otanias, host of Getting High on Anthropology. Tonight we have Josh Scott. Um, again, Josh, thanks for taking the time uh, to be with us tonight. So back to the work that you're doing. And before we go deeper into some of the themes and the issues about workplace safety and um, occupational um, issues, so so what's your training? Like, do you have a certificate in cannabis studies? Did you work as a trimmer? So like, what's your trajectory? Like, how'd you get to this point? Uh, aside from consumption? No. no. Uh, it's a joke for everyone who is listening. Um, uh, so my actually my background, you know, was originally in health promotion, you know, like um, exercise physiology and eating right and exercising. Um, I actually I taught at Notre Dame for four years in that, uh, and then I started working essentially for the government in occupational safety for a couple years. Um, Fast forward, I joined this group at the, at the Center for Health, Work, and Environment here on, uh, on our campus. And we're about kind of integrating both health promotion, right, like well, worksite wellness, and health protection. It's called Total Worker Health. And, and it was like the perfect marriage between wanting to really um, better people's lives on a kind of a promotional level, but also making sure that their work and their life is free of hazards. So that's... It's a weird kind of, we all take convoluted paths to get here, and that was mine. No, that's great. And health promotion, yeah, it's so important just, again, for information, behavioral change, and to ensure people, when they go home, they're not having aches and pains, yeah. you know, with their job. So um, about your university, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, to get this going, like, was there internal obstacles? Because I understand as a public university, there's some uncertainty about, you know, what you can and can't do in this environment and what the administration at the federal level is going to do. So was there one or two obstacles you faced early on, and how did you overcome those obstacles? You know, I think the biggest obstacle would have been, and which I think we, you know, you got part of this conversation, which we foresaw was using university or government funds to produce the training, that wasn't going to happen. And we just decided to steer away from that obstacle because we knew there would be, it would be a barrier uh, to being able to host it and to produce it and to spend time doing it. So, you know, we kind of did it a little bit on our own dime, underwrote the cost. Um, and we, you know, we did charge for the training, but it only helped to underwrite the cost of producing the training. We didn't, and we provided lunch and things like that. Um, but so the, really the biggest barrier was that we couldn't use funds that would normally have been available um, for that purpose. And that's because of like the stigma associated, because you're not in a room passing out marijuana, it's just information. So is the fear that this is gonna promote smoking and yeah, cannabis? You know, I think, I think we just knew it was a controversial topic and our timeline for producing it was so short that we didn't wanna change somebody's viewpoint of even working with the cannabis industry. Um, we knew that we just wanted to produce the training. And, and we know that there are various opinions out there. I mean, even within groups we work with, you have people who are very, you know, uh, uh, pro-weed and pro-cannabis and folks who say, no, we just want to do research on the, on the health effects. And, and we didn't even want to have that conversation. 
So we know that they exist, and we wanted to avoid it. Got it. For no. now. Okay. <laughs> And so now let's get back to the training. From your involvement and your interaction with um, other group members who helped organize it, um, you know, you're, uh, I'm sure you've done some reading and you have literature, um, but when you look at the actual training, what's one or two like specific job classifications and one or two concerns or risks that a person would face in the cannabis sector? Uh, yeah, so I would say, you know, we oftentimes focus on the jobs associated with, with cultivating. Um, so that might not be, uh, so we'll maybe take away extracting, right? We'll just focus on, so within cultivating, right, you have trimmers, bud trimmers, and there are both manual ways of trimming bud and automatic ways, right? like automatic bud trimmers. But I've seen um, automatic bud trimmers that are very sophisticated, and they might have guards on all their moving parts so you can't stick your hands in. And I've seen also things that look like basically giant fans that people remove the shrouds off of that if you put your hand in it would remove your fingernail or chop a finger off and so you know that's a concept called machine guarding and we want to make sure that people know if you have moving parts here's how you protect against having any sort of exposure to that right um, another one might be you know with with butt trimming you have a ton of manual butt trimming you have a ton of repetitive motion right yeah, I mean, ergonomic issues. it's a ton right so it might be um, the height of the desk that you're trimming at. If you have somebody who's five feet tall and somebody who's seven feet tall trimming bud at the same height, you're going to have one person hunched over and one person working up here. And you can do that eight hours a and day, you do 40 that, hours a week. Yeah, and within six months, you're going to have some issues. And so it's, you know, it, people don't think like an occupational health person. So it's really getting people to think, well, this might not affect me today. But what's going to happen six months from now? And if it takes six months to manifest, how long is it going to take to treat it? So from the worker's perspective, um, is there a place people can go to find out about more of the training? Or if they find there's an issue that could be improved, like is OSHA a resource? Is there a state labor department? that like? What are a couple of resources? And of course, how can people get more information about the training? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we were prompted, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, um, we did record and webcast that second training, and then we ended up producing kind of an online accessible version of it. So, you know, hopefully we can send it out as, as um, part of this recording. Um, so people can access the training that way. They can, they can have all recorded six hours worth of content plus the resources that go along with that. I mean, we were doing things called job hazard analyses and they'll have access to all that material. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll give that, or uh, that's available to people. Is it free or is there a cost for it? There is a cost right now. Um, it's $49 for the six hours worth of training. Um, but you know, if there are groups that wanna purchase multiple, we're certainly willing to offer a discount. And honestly, that money goes straight back into producing more training. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it doesn't go to, we're, you know, we're a nonprofit that's part of an academic unit. Like, we don't make any money. Yeah, you're not generating revenue necessarily. No, no, it just goes into producing more training. Yeah, or improving that training. Okay, so it's a good cause. Yeah, I think, you know, anyone who's willing to take it is hopefully willing to also kind of support that cause. Um, as far as, like, resources, if people want to get consultation, um, OSHA has what's called the OSHA Consultation Service, where it's actually trained consultants who don't, uh, work for an OSHA office, but who are trained in how to do inspections. And um, they're out at the CSU campus up in Fort Collins. And we can supply the information on how to get, uh, actually a colleague of mine, Bill, Bill Brazil, um, manages that OSHA consultation service. Um, so people can come, they can have kind of a mock OSHA audit and understand um, what they are at risk for. Great. Um, there are also other groups like the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, private consulting groups, and um, uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health that has a local office. They're all willing to help and provide um, consultative support. Great. So there's resources out there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. And what about your knowledge? And I haven't systematically examined this, <laughs> but I understand in Colorado, when you look at the workforce in the legal cannabis sector, there is a relatively high rate of consumption of cannabis on the job. So, so do you see um, like an alarming number of accidents and workplace problems because people may be consuming on the job? Or is there any kind of correlation there? Yeah. 
So what's, what's really challenging is that uh, in 2017, um, OSHA issued what was called the anti-retaliation provision. And one part of that provision was that because there's no um, legal tox level for for weed, right? I mean, we don't know that if, if your THC level in your blood is X amount that you're gonna have this level decrease of performance. So we have a lot of assumptions that say if people consume on the job, they're gonna experience more workplace hazards, but we're actually not allowed to really test that and use that information. Mm. So anecdotally, yes, I mean, you know, any sort of impairment on the job when you're handling shears or doing repetitive motion work or up on scaffolding, like, it's gonna be a hazard. But we don't have a lot, uh, we have a lot of anecdotal information to support it, but not a lot of hard evidence. Got it, yeah, I was yeah. just curious, because people come up to me, you know, because they know I'm involved in trying to understand cannabis, you know, workplace issues, uh, labor rights issues, and so people ask me, like, are the, you know, number of, instances of, of occupational hazards or risks or injuries off the charts because people are consuming so much. And, um, you know, I, I think um, it definitely needs to be addressed because I do know that some companies have a policy yep. that you cannot consume, but the question is the implementation of the policy. And then some people joke if you actually implement it, you wouldn't have any workers. Um, yeah, or what happens before and after, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not like uh, if you get high before work and then you go in, all of a sudden you're not high anymore. You right. know what I mean? it's like, yeah. So it's a really hard thing to implement because it's hard to test for uh, and it's hard to know how impaired somebody is. And people have different levels of impairment. People are super high functioning, you know, while they're high. And so it's really, it's a really, it's a big issue. Yeah. It's hard to tackle. Yeah, and definitely something that needs more research, more education. Yeah. So, uh, Josh, I think the work you're doing is great. It's definitely, um, there's such a huge unmet need to raise awareness, get employers, you know, to look at these best practices, get employees to understand that there's um, things they can do to protect their health. So what's in the future for the trainings, like in 2018? And then, of course, one more time, is there a website, or how can people get a hold of you to learn more about the trainings? Yeah, so to learn more about the trainings, um, uh, the Center for Health, Work, and Environment um, has a website. I also encourage people to email me directly. So joshua.scott at ucdenver.edu, and I will supply you with any information you're looking for about how to access uh, uh, marijuana cultivation safety resources. I mean, we are, uh, uh, we're at the center point of a lot of the activity that's happening around it. Um, and then as far as what's gonna happen for 2018, uh, we're gonna be producing um, uh, a couple of both um, kind of webinar style trainings and then a couple of live trainings. And then we're actually gonna reproduce the general training again as well. We think that there are a lot of people who still want that general information because there's a lot of turnover um, in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So there are new workers all the time. I think one thing we're also curious about from an academic Pandemic standpoint is um, job security. We know that in this administration, people are feeling uneasy. Some people feel uh, more empowered in the state of Colorado. Some people are maybe pulling out, and we want to know how that's affecting people's work. Um, so I think that'll be something we engage more in in the future as well. Excellent. Well, again, so nice to talk to you. Um, really enjoy what you're doing. Uh, I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. This is Getting High on Anthropology. You can find us at www.fsandgreen.org shows. <laughs> <laughs>